And I want to talk to you from Matthew chapter 15 about a subject that Brother Buddy just sang about, about the subject of prayer. And while you're turning there, if I could say this, prayer is what connects our failures to God's forgiveness. And how many of you tonight are thankful for 1 John 1, 9? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just, right? To forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, right? And so prayer connects our failures to God's forgiveness. Tonight, prayer is what connects our need to God's provision. How many of you are thankful tonight for Philippians 4, 19, right? My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And those of us that are faithful to give to support the work of the Lord, God says, you won't lack, you won't, need, you won't have need. But many times prayer is that avenue that we can call on God to meet our need when we need his provision. But prayer is what connects our, our weakness to, to God's strength. You ever feel like you just need the grace of God in your life? You just need the strength of God in your life? You just need a little bit of strength to go another mile? And I'm thankful for 2 Corinthians 12, 9 this, this evening, where the Bible says, My grace is sufficient for thee. The Apostle Paul had a thorn, and he went to the Lord three times and said, God, I want this thorn to go away. And God didn't answer his prayer the way that he wanted him to. And three times, I don't think it was just three quick prayers, Pastor, that he went to the Lord on that. I think he had three seasons of prayer that the Apostle Paul took that, that thorn to the Lord and said, Lord, would, it, would you have it be removed? And God said, no, 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 but my grace is sufficient for thee. And, and through prayer, Paul learned the secret of having the strength that, that he needed in times of weakness. I'm thankful tonight for prayer. I'm thankful for the, the night when I was 15 years old and I realized my need for a Savior and I bowed my knee and claimed the promise that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm thankful that whenever I call upon the Lord, he says in Jeremiah 33, 3, Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Are you thankful for prayer tonight? Matthew 21, 22 says, In all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. Romans 8, 32, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Deuteronomy 4, 7 says, For what nation is there so great, who hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God in all things that we call upon him for? I remember years ago I went into a, uh, a recovery facility. That is some good water. Is that Kentucky water? Wow, that is the best water I think I might have ever drank. Wow, that's incredible. Man, I feel holy already. That's good stuff, Brother Pastor Doug. But um, back in 2010, I went into a Christian recovery facility. I'd mentioned in my testimony, I have had some struggles with drugs and alcohol along the way. And there's been many times, and I'm thankful for it tonight, that there's been many times where the Lord has not left me out in sin, but he's come back and rescued me out of that, that, uh, that position, that place. And tonight, there's no more miserable person than a child of God trying to find satisfaction and trying to find fulfillment in this world. And God many times has rescued me out of that place, and I'm thankful for that tonight. But I was in this place in Illinois where it was a recovery facility, and it was a, it was a nursing home that was kind of renovated to become this recovery facility. There was a couple guys to a room. There was bunk beds in the rooms, and I stayed there for a few months. And I noticed as I got into this facility that it wasn't really fancy, kind of like Crossroads Rescue Mission. If you pull up at Crossroads Rescue Mission, how many of the guys know there's no Olympic-sized swimming pool at Crossroads? There's no, there's no tennis courts there. There's, no, uh, there's nothing really fancy about it. It's kind of a run-down school building that's been renovated, and uh, they've paved the parking lot recent, in recent months. But up until that time, it was a gravel parking lot, and one pastor described it kind of like the Jordan River. You know, it's kind of a, just kind of Crossroads. And this place was a lot like Crossroads in that way. And I remember as I was in this facility for the first month I looked up and was kind of checking the place out and I noticed up along the wall that there was a cord hanging out of the wall and above it it said pull here for help now I, I don't I know it was, a, it was a nursing home facility in the past and I can imagine that some of the uh, some of the clients or some of the residents living in that room would pull that pull that cord maybe in an emergency maybe when they needed something to drink so I went over there just out of curiosity to just to see what would happen and I walked over to that cord and I pulled the cord it said, pull here for help. And I thought, man, I could use something to drink, right? I could use something to eat. And I pulled that cord and waited. Looked out the door, looked out to see down the hallway. To see, and nobody was coming, Pastor. Nobody was coming with a menu. Nobody was coming with a tray to see if I wanted anything to drink. So I went over and I pulled it again. Nothing happened again. False advertisement. And so I came to the conclusion that day that that's false advertisement. I never pulled that cord again. Now, I tell that silly example because a lot of times as a believer, we have this cord that God has called prayer. Yeah. 
We can pull that cord of prayer. And aren't you thankful tonight that when we have a need, when we have a failure, when we have a problem, when we have a trial, when we have a burden, that we can go to God and we can pull the cord of prayer. But if you're like me, many times maybe you've gone to God in prayer and maybe you've brought that need before Him or you've brought that burden before Him or you've sought Him in that trial and you've pulled that cord of prayer. And How many of you can be honest tonight and say, I've pulled the cord of prayer at one time and God has never seemed to answer that prayer? Maybe tonight you went to God on behalf of a family member that's not saved and you had a burden for that family member and you went to the Lord maybe and you said, God, I know that you're not willing that any should perish. God, you said in your word that you'll have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And you went to God on their behalf and you pulled that cord of prayer and you said, God, would you save my loved one? God, would you save my mother or my father or my, my relative? And God seemed to, to not answer that prayer. Maybe you had a financial need and the pressure was on and the bill was due and you went to the Lord and you said, God, I need you to provide this need and, and you pulled that cord of prayer and, and God seemed to not answer that prayer. You've been there tonight. Yeah, right. And God, I'm thankful for in Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 3 that the Bible says you can call unto me. God makes a promise there and says, call unto me, he says, and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. God says to us tonight, call unto me when you're sick and when you need healing. God says, call unto me when you're weary and you need strength. God says, call unto me when you're at a crossroads and you're facing a decision and you don't know quite which way to go. God says, call unto me. I'll give you wisdom. I'll give you guidance. He says, call unto me when you need revival in your life. I'm thankful tonight that when I get a little cold and my love seems to get a little cold towards the Lord, that I can go to God with this Bible in my hand and say, Lord, I'm calling unto you. God, I need revival. God, I need you to stir my heart tonight. God, I need you to, to, to bring me back to my first love and God says I'll answer thee I love what Martin Tupper said he said this he said that prayer is the slender nerve that moves the muscles of God's omnipotence yeah. Yeah. Now, I remember that day as I pulled that cord that, and, and as I was waiting and I was uh, just expecting maybe somebody to come and respond to that call for help that nothing happened and so I never pulled that cord again but what do we do tonight when we pull the cord of prayer and nothing happens what do we do tonight like when Buddy sang the song a moment ago when, when God, we seem, it seems like God's saying to us, I'm through patching it up, I'm through answering, I'm through talking to you. Maybe we've fallen out into sin or we've gotten away from the Lord or gotten off that path and we go to God and we pull that cord and it's an urgent prayer request and we need God to step into our life and what do we do when God just seems to turn a deaf ear to our prayer? We pull that cord of prayer and what do we do when... When God is silent in our lives. In Matthew chapter 15, we are introduced to a woman who approaches Jesus and she tries to pull the cord of prayer, and something similar happens to her. And notice verse 21, it says this that Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. Now, Tyre was a Phoenician city on the Mediterranean that flourished in commerce and was very large and splendid at the time, it was a powerful city by land and by sea. And then it mentions Sidon, which means hunting. It was an ancient and wealthy city of Phoenicia on the east coast of of the Mediterranean Sea less than 20 miles north of Tyre. So here the disciples come with Jesus and they're, they're departing into the coast of Tyre, into the coast of Sidon. And a lot of Bible scholars believe now that they're headed out of town to, for a time of rest. They've had a busy ministry season. They're going to take a little break, take a little breather, maybe a vacation, if you will. And this plan for rest gets interrupted in verse number 22 by this Canaanitish woman. Notice verse 22. It says, And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy upon me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. Here's her urgent request. Now, she needs a miracle that Jesus only can do. Have you ever, you ever been in need of a miracle tonight? You ever need God to do something? You ever need God to answer a prayer in your life? And here's this woman, and she's got this need, and it seems like a legitimate need. Her daughter is possessed by a demon. Now, how many of you would say tonight, that's a pretty legit request? To bring before a Lord who can do all things. I'm thankful that when I pray, I pray unto a God that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that I could ever ask or think. And here she comes to Jesus who can do all things, and Jesus could merely speak the word, and that would solve the problem. But notice what he says. He doesn't say anything, verse 23. But he answered her not a word. Jesus could merely speak the word and that would solve her problem. But instead, he says nothing. Just silence. Not even an acknowledgement of her plea, just silence. He doesn't ask about her daughter. He doesn't ask how bad it is. He doesn't ask where she lives or how old she is. He just says absolutely nothing. Now, at first glance, it seems rather heartless at the time right it seems that way when you first glance at it that Jesus would ignore this passionate request born out of such an urgent need maybe you've been there tonight 
Maybe you bring your need to the Lord and you say, Lord, I've got this burden. Lord, I've got this health condition. Lord, I've got this financial need. Lord, I've got this wayward child. God, I've got this request that's just weighing me down to the point that, God, I need you to hear my prayer. And if you ever had the Lord seem to turn a deaf ear to the most urgent need and the most urgent prayer request in your life. Now, as I look into the Word of God, there's many times why God doesn't answer prayer that I find. And I think of Lamentations 3.44, which says this, Thou hast covered thyself with a cloud that our prayer should not pass through. You ever been there tonight? I think of Isaiah chapter 59 and verse number 1, where it says this, Behold, the Lord's ear is not heavy that it cannot hear, neither is his, arm, uh, his hand shortened that it cannot save. Verse 2, But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he, not that he cannot hear, but that he will not hear here and I wrote down a couple reasons tonight why God doesn't answer our prayer sometimes the Bible says if we if we harbor sin in our hearts God will not hear our prayer tonight right. Psalm 66 18 if I regard iniquity in my heart the Lord will not cannot but will not hear my prayer tonight if I turn away my ear from hearing the word of God God won't hear my prayer tonight right. Proverbs 28 9 says this he that turneth away his ear from hearing the law even his prayer shall be an abomination to the Lord right. The Bible says that when I reject the knowledge of God, that God won't hear my prayer. Hosea 4, 6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, he said, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. He said, Because thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. Can I say tonight that when we ignore the cry of the needy people around us and lost souls around us, that God won't hear our prayer. Proverbs 21, 13 says that whoso stoppeth his ears at the cry of the poor, he also shall cry himself, but shall not be heard. When we choose not to fear the Lord, God won't hear our prayer. Proverbs 1.28 says, Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. Why? They're that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Can I say tonight that when we pray in unbelief, God won't answer our prayer. James 1.6, But let him ask in faith nothing wavering. For he that waveth, wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. The Bible says when we, we, we have wrong motives in our prayers that God won't hear our prayers. James 4.3 says, You ask and receive not. Why? Because we ask amiss that we may consume it upon our lusts. The Bible says that when, we, when there's wickedness present in our lives, God won't hear us. And the Lord is far from the wicked. He heareth the prayer of the righteous. Now, we know why God doesn't answer prayer tonight. If you've read this Bible for a little bit of time, we know that God is a holy God. And God is a righteous God. And God is a just God. And God is so holy that He cannot look upon sin. God is so holy tonight that when His own very Son, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God, was crucified on the cross, God turned away and Jesus cried out, My God, literally my judge, why hast thou forsaken me? Why did Jesus cry out like that? Because God was so holy that when our Savior took upon Himself and in His body bore our sins in His own body on the tree, the holy God of heaven had to look away because He could not look upon sin. So we know when God doesn't answer because of sin, but what do we, what, how do we respond when God is silent in our lives? What do we say to God when God says nothing? And I want to give an example of this lady tonight as we look into this passage in Matthew chapter 15, what we can do when God is silent in our lives. Amen. How do we respond when God doesn't seem to answer the prayers that are so urgent on our, on our hearts? And I want to say, number one, if you look with me, uh, the first response of this woman to Jesus' silence was this. She expressed her worship to Him. Verse number 25 says this, Then came she, well notice verse number 24, but He answered and said, He said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Verse 25, Then came she and worshipped Him. Jesus had just told her basically that she, had, she was not his target audience. She said to this lady, she said, Jesus basically told her, I'm not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. In other words, you're a Syrophoenician woman. Uh, you're, not the, you're not the people that I came to initially uh, minister to is basically what he's saying. He said, I came to the Jews first. Now, she worshipped him. The word worship means this, to kiss the hand towards, in token of reverence, to kneel prostrate or to do homage. It literally means to ascribe worth. And notice her response of worship to the Lord after Jesus tells her that she's not his target audience. She ascribes worth to the Lord. And her worship to him was basically saying this, Lord, you're the sovereign uh, Savior of the world, and you have the right to do whatever you want to do. And one of the best things you and I can do tonight when God is silent in our lives is to express our worship before Him, to get down on our faces before Him, and acknowledge that our life is in His hands, our circumstances are in His control, and that God is the God of heaven, God is the God of the universe, and that as God, God has the right to do whatever He wants to do. Because He's sovereign, because He's Lord, and He's worthy of our worship tonight. Joni Erickson taught a Many of you know her, was known as, a, as an artist and 
Many of, many of you know about her accident that she had. She was a quadriplegic. She was in a, a terrible accident that left her a quadriplegic. And in spite of her physical limitations, she became an, an accomplished author and artist. And over 31 years ago, she married her husband, whose name was Ken. Now, like every woman that plans that wedding day, she had planned to come down that center aisle in her motorized wheelchair. And just before her grand entrance on her great day, the greatest day of her life, she noticed a couple of problems. The first problem she noticed was that her... Uh, her, her flowers had fallen down and slipped between her leg and the chair and she had no way to get those flowers back up. The second problem she noticed was that her gown had rolled underneath her wheelchair wheel and there's a big grease stain on it. And she's stressing out and she's thinking my life is ruined and this wedding day has been, has been just, just ruined because of these two problems. And while she was stressing about all of that, suddenly the doors to the auditorium opened and she saw her husband to be and she said this, when she saw Ken's face, she said, all I could think of was him. She said, everything else, the people in the church, the flowers that were sitting in my lap, the fact that my dress didn't fall right because I was sitting in a wheelchair. She said, the grease marks, the rip in my gown. She said, all of it paled in comparison to seeing his face. Can I say tonight that when we truly worship the Lord, when we truly recognize that He is the sovereign God of heaven, that He has the right to do as He pleases because He created everything and He rules on the throne of our lives tonight, that things can go wrong. You can have a trial. You can have a financial difficulty tonight. You can have a burden. You can go through a hard time. But when we turn our eyes upon Jesus and look full in His wonderful face, all the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of His glory, in the light of His grace tonight. And sometimes tonight, we just got to worship the Lord and ascribe worth to the Lord and kneel prostrate before him and say God you're worthy no matter what's going on in my life God I want to worship you God I want to turn my eyes upon Jesus I think of what it says in the book of Hebrews the book of Hebrews says this wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us looking unto Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God this woman, she expressed her worship when Jesus was silent. But notice the second action that she takes tonight. She simplified her prayer. Now notice the contrast in her prayers. Verse number 25, she says, Lord, help me. But notice what she prayed in verse number 22. It says, Behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Notice this prayer. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. Now, there's a lot in that prayer. She's acknowledging that Jesus is the promised Messiah that would come through the lineage of David. This, this girl knows some stuff about prophecy. And she has all the right rhetoric. And she has all the right words to her prayer. And she comes to Jesus and she says, Thou son of David. And Jesus ignores her rhetoric. Jesus ignores those fancy words. Jesus ignores her, her eloquent prayer, if you will. And she, she, after verse number 25, when, or verse 23, when Jesus walks away from her prayer, she worships him. She drops the religious rhetoric. She drops the fancy prayer. She gets desperate and she simplifies her request and she says this, Lord, help me. Yeah. Sometimes when God is silent, He's waiting for us to drop some of the religious rhetoric and drop some of the motions that we go through. And it's easy tonight. It's easy to go through the motions and, and we're Baptists and we've got ties on tonight and we've know, we know how to dress. We know how to say amen. But can I say tonight that sometimes there's a burden and sometimes there's a prayer request that goes beyond the religious rhetoric and it goes beyond the formality and it goes beyond all the rhythmic cadence that we can get caught up into. And sometimes we just need to worship the Lord and step back and drop the religious rhetoric and say, Lord, help me. Lord, save him. Lord, provide. Lord, call, I'm calling out to you. And she simplified her request as she called upon Jesus. She humbles herself in the dust and worships the Lord and utters a simple, heartfelt, childlike prayer and says, Lord, I need you to help me. Samuel Chadwick said this. He said, the prayer that prevails is not the work of lips and fingertips. It is the cry of a broken heart and the travail of a stricken soul. Sometimes when we pray, we beg God for, to beg for God to do something and He, he waits, us, waits for us to get real with Him. Sometimes God just wants us to drop some of the fancy words and just cry out from our heart. I forget who said it, but he said this, it's better to have prayer without words than to have words without prayer. Sometimes, and I'm thankful for the ministry of the Holy Spirit of God tonight, that when I don't know exactly how to pray and when I've got a burden, the Bible says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we not. And sometimes we can't just offer the right prayer. Sometimes I don't have the words to say. I don't know what prayer to pray. But the Holy Spirit of God makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And I'm thankful tonight for the ministry of the Holy Spirit of God. I think of what, it, I think of what Jesus said in Luke chapter 18 where 
Two men went up into the temple to pray. The Bible says that one was a Pharisee and one was a publican. Remember the story of the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. He said, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican, he said. He said, I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. The Bible says he prayed with himself. But the Bible says that the publican was standing afar off and he would not even lift up his eyes up unto heaven, but he smote upon his breast and he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The Bible says that man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself should be abased, but he that humbleth himself should be exalted, the Bible says. Sometimes we need to just simplify our request and cry out. The Holy Spirit can interpret those prayers better than we can anyway. Amen. Number three tonight. When God is silent, she not only expressed her worship, she simplified her prayer, but she accepted her position. Notice verse 26. He answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. Now, she was basically being compared to a dog. Now, how many of you tonight would, would, be, would be complimented if somebody said, You know, you look like a look like a pit bull tonight you know you look like a, a chihuahua or a, you look like a black you know you remind me of a certain kind of dog and I can't that's it you remind me of a black lab I don't you take that as a compliment tonight probably not that's kind of an insult right she's being compared to a dog here and Jesus is saying it's not meat to take the children's bread he's talking about the truth there and to cast it to dogs he's referring to Gentiles there that's the, that's that's the interpretation of it but she she could have been offended by that but notice she accepts her position before the Lord humbly and she says this truth Lord truth Lord And in essence, here's what she's saying as she accepts her position. She's saying this, Lord, I may not be a Jewish woman. I may not be to be deserved to be treated with favor like all these other women are. And you may compare me to a dog. And truth, Lord, whatever you say about me is that that's what I'll accept. But I got some good news. I got some good news for us tonight. Is that if you're a blood-bought, born-again child of God, God has some wonderful things to say about you. And we can embrace our position before the Lord. He says this in Romans 8. Verse 1, note, there's no condemnation to those of us who are in Christ Jesus. He said we are freed from the law of sin and from the law of death. God says we have the spirit of the living God dwelling inside of us. He says we are joint heirs with Christ. He says all things work together for good. He said if God be for us, who can be against us? He said we've been justified. We've been declared righteous. He said we have an intercessor who prays for us tonight. He says we cannot be separated from his love. As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And you know what we ought to say to all that like this woman? Truth, Lord. How are you, aren't you thankful tonight that what God used to say about us as a sinner, alienated from God, separated from God, and in our own mind, enemies in our mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death. And thank God tonight, we don't have to identify how we used to be. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians in chapter, verse, uh, chapter 6, Paul's writing to this carnal, wicked, fleshly church, and he says this, he says, Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? He gives this list of sinners. He says, Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor, nor adulterers. He says, no, uh, Nor idolaters shall inherit the kingdom of God. Wow, that's a pretty hefty list. Amen. And such were some of you, he said. But ye are washed, but ye are justified, but ye are sanctified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. And I thank God tonight that what I used to be, I no longer am. And though I had the condemnation upon of my heart, the condemnation of the world was upon me, and I was a, a sinner on my way to hell, that when the blood of Jesus Christ cleansed me and forgave me and set me on my way to heaven, I was translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of His dear Son. Now I can embrace what this Bible says about me, that in Christ I'm a new creature, and I have a new destination. I have the Spirit of the living God living inside of me. I'm a joint heir with Christ. I'm on a way to heaven and not no longer on my way to hell. We ought to say truth, Lord, to all that. By the way, one of the main reasons God is silent in our lives is because of the presence of unconfessed sin. And when the Spirit of God puts His finger on a sin in our life, we ought to say like, like the woman said, truth, Lord. Because the Bible says in Proverbs 28, 13, He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. You know, when the Holy Spirit of God says, hey, I want you to get rid of that, you know what we ought to say? Truth, Lord. I agree with that, Lord. I say the same thing. I confess it and get it out of my life. When God is silent tonight, we've got to express our worship to Him. He's God. He can do as He sees fit. We've got to simplify our request tonight. We've got to accept our position and really embrace who God says we are tonight in Christ. But notice number four, what she does. She perseveres in that prayer. In that prayer. Notice verse 27, she accepts her position and then she says this three-letter word. She says, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Now, in taking her position before the Lord as a dog, she could have thought of all the negative characteristics that are associated with dogs, right? She could have said, well, dogs are filthy, dogs are stinky, they're not as bad as cats, but dogs are just, uh, you know, they're, they're scavengers. How many cat lovers in the house tonight? 
I'll pray for you. <laughs> but instead, she has this positive outlook on it, and she says, she says, you know, dogs enjoy the privilege of eating the crumbs which fall from, their, from the master's table. Wow, what a, what a powerful perspective she has. And she perseveres in her request, and she grabs a hold of that little hope that she has that Jesus might just hear her prayer, and she perseveres in her prayer. And sometimes when we pray for something, and God seems to turn a deaf ear, and God seems to be silent, sometimes God is just waiting for us to show Him that we're serious about that thing. God's waiting for us to persevere in that request. And I want to ask tonight, what is it that we're praying for that we've given up praying for because we haven't seen an answer? What lost loved one have you prayed for a couple times but you've given up because they show no signs of hearing any, uh, no signs of interest in the gospel? What prayer have we given up on because we didn't persevere in our request? I think of Jacob and his predicament in the Old Testament how it says that Jacob, uh, he said to the Lord, I will not let thee go except thou bless thee, bless me. Yeah. We've got to persevere in our request tonight. But notice number five, if we're going to, when God is silent, if we're going to pray through, we've got to acknowledge who our master is. Now, notice what she says here. She says at the end of verse number 27, she says, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of their crumbs which fall from their master's table. And she mentions the relationship of a dog to a master. Now, dogs are some of the most obedient, when trained, some of the most obedient animal, animals. They'll wait for you. They'll, they'll do what you say. They will, they're, they're obedient. And, he, and this woman is, 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 re, is referring to this relationship between a master and a dog. When God is silent, maybe God is waiting for us to reestablish him as Lord and master of our life tonight. What kind of message would it send tonight? Think with me tonight. What kind of message would it send if I'm praying for things and I have needs and I have burdens and I need God's grace and I need God's provision and I need God's forgiveness and I'm going to God and I'm asking God for these things, but yet I'm not making him master and Lord of my life. What if I'm harboring sin? What if I'm walking in darkness in my life and yet I'm praying for all these things? Now what kind of message would God send to me if he were to answer all those prayers in my life while he's not master and Lord of my life? Here's, what, here's the message that it would send. This is the message that it would send. It would tell me that I can continue to live in sin and continue to walk in darkness and continue to keep him number two or number three on the list, not my master, and he'll just give me whatever I pray for. So can I tell you, can I share what he does in my life a lot of times? A lot of times he'll be silent to my prayer requests. And he'll not answer that request that I have. Because I've not have him at number one. I've got him at number two or number three. So I'll go to pray for something and God will turn a, a deaf ear to my prayer. He'll, he'll be silent. He won't answer it. And all the whole time the Holy Spirit's putting his finger on something saying, Hey, get this right and I'll answer it. Confess that sin and I'll, and I'll save him. Hey, t turn that off and, 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 and cut that off and, and, and don't watch that. And maybe I'll come through for you, he says. We've got to reestablish him as Lord and Master of our life. The Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things shall be added unto you. It's like putting on a shirt in the morning. And uh, there's been a couple times when I've been gotten dressed in a hurry and tried to put on the button-up shirt, Pastor. And, you know, I, there's been a couple times when I put that button-up shirt on, and I got to the end and got to the bottom, I had two shirt tails like this. What does that mean when you got two shirt tails like this? It means the, the, you ain't got the first one right. That means you got the first button in the second hole. That doesn't work. Now, it doesn't matter how much of a hurry you're in. You've got you to straighten that thing out. And as the first button goes, watch this now. The second button lines up, and the third button lines up, and the fourth button lines up. The Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things shall be added unto you. And isn't it true tonight that, that when we honor God on Sunday and make the house of God a priority, and we put that first button in place for the week, that Monday goes a lot better, and Tuesday goes a lot better, and Wednesday goes a lot better, and Thursday goes a lot better, and Friday goes a lot better, and Saturday comes, and you're ready to go back to, that, to the house of God to get it right again for the next week. Isn't it amazing? Amazing. How when we seek God first and keep Him as Lord and Master of our lives, everything else just seems to line up. The same is true every day when we honor God in the morning and we spend time in prayer and in the Word of God and we put Him first in our life that everything in the day, so you get to lunchtime and things just sort of line up. And The Bible says that if we make Him Master and keep Him Master, that He will give all these other things according to His will. Notice, six, notice finally tonight, and I'm done. The final thing she does as Jesus is silent in her life is that she rests on his word. Notice verse 28. Jesus answered and said unto her, He said, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Hallelujah. But this woman had great faith. But let me ask you a question tonight. Where does faith come from? So then, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So where did this woman get faith from? Where did she get it from? She had faith. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. I don't know if this is how it happened, but you remember back in Matthew chapter 9, a few chapters earlier, 
when Jesus is facing the religious crowd and he goes into the house of Matthew the publican and he says to those, those that were gathered, there was publicans, there were sinners, but there was also Pharisees and Sadducees there. Jesus said, when he heard that, he said unto them, they that be whole need not a physician. Remember that? But they that are sick, but go ye and learn what that meaneth. He said, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. And there in that crowd, there was, there was Pharisees, there was, there was publicans, there were sinners, there were Sadducees. And Jesus makes the promise and says, I will have mercy. Pastor, I can imagine the gossip sessions that happened about our Lord. I can imagine as people sat back and said, can you, can you believe what Jesus said, that man that claims to be the Messiah? He went into the house of a tax collector, the people stealing money from us, and he told them that he will have mercy upon them. He said he's not going to give them what they deserve for taking our money. Can you believe that? And I just imagine the gossip sessions that went on behind Jesus' back. But I wonder tonight if that woman, in the midst of all that, heard through the grapevine that, yeah, Jesus was showing mercy upon tax collectors. But I wonder if she heard that four-word promise that he made where he said, I will have mercy. And I wonder tonight, I don't know, but I wonder if she heard that promise and said, you know what, I wonder if Jesus said he'll have mercy on them. I wonder if Jesus will have mercy upon me. I wonder if Jesus said he won't give a tax collector the judgment that, and the, the punishment that they deserve. I wonder if he'll heal my daughter who's possessed with the devil. And I wonder if she just reached out and grabbed the hold of the word of Jesus and said I want to rest my faith upon his word Jesus said great is thy faith faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God here's a woman that reaches out and grabs a hold of the promise of Jesus and says Jesus I'm not giving up until you come through until you answer my prayer and I want to challenge us tonight to rest our faith upon the word of God no matter the need, no matter the burden, no matter the struggle, no matter the temptation, no matter the trial we might be going through, if Jesus is silent in our lives, I believe tonight we can reach out and grab a promise and rest our faith upon His Word. Express our worship to Him tonight. Simplify our request. Accept our position confidently before the Lord. Persevere in that request. Make Him Lord and keep Him Lord and Master throughout this week and rest our faith upon His Word. Let's pray tonight. Father, I love you tonight, and I'm thankful for this example that we find in the book of Matthew about this woman that uh, when you were silent, when you seemed to ignore her prayer, she persevered, and she, she worshiped you, Lord, and she reestablished you as master, Lord, and she, she rested her faith upon, her word, upon your word. And tonight, Lord, I pray that you work in our hearts, Father. I pray that if there's a need that somebody might have, Lord, if there's a, a prayer request that's not been answered, Lord, if it's because of unconfessed sin, God, I pray tonight they would confess it. They'd just get clean, Lord. There's nothing like being clean before you, Lord. There's nothing like being right with you tonight, Lord. And I pray you'd work in our hearts in Christ's name. Amen. Pastor. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.